Welcome back, everyone, as we dive into parts 11 and 12. This is the finale for this reaction series to Justinian and Theodora. Hope you guys have been enjoying it. If you haven't seen the first several episodes of this, there's a link in the description. It'll take you back to the beginning. I also have the link to the original content so you can check out not only this video, but all of the videos from Extra History. They do a great job with them. And I want to give a big shout out to Cole in Pulaski, Tennessee, and Santiago in Houston, Texas. Thank you so much for all of your support. I'm excited. I'm headed up to D-Day, Ohio today. Hopefully get to meet some of you. It's an annual World War II reenactment that takes place in Conneaut, Ohio, on the shores of Lake Erie. I'm going to be filming a lot of content. Hopefully bring some of that to you on the channel here real soon. But let's go ahead and dive into parts 11 and 12 of Justinian and Theodora. Thanks to Theodora, the vulnerable Justinian hadn't been assassinated or supplanted, and he still had an empire to wake up to. But some of his enemies had kept busy during his long sleep. The plague had left a permanent scar on the Byzantine Empire. Nearly a quarter of its citizens lay dead. Crops had failed, trade had ground to a halt, and imperial revenue simply hadn't come in. The short-term consequences of this were apparent to anybody who saw the mass graves, but the long-term effects ran still deeper. In Italy, the Gothic tribes had rebelled. Having felt cheated by Belisarius' betrayal and unhappy with Roman rule, the tribes seized the opportunity to rearm and prepare for war as play- So, honestly, there are going to be areas that aren't as badly hit, and I would think that more civilized, more advanced uh, societies are going to be hit worse because they're going to tend to have more people in cities, more people interacting with each other. These more nomadic or more spread out tribes that maybe don't have big cities, maybe don't fare as badly. And so that's going to give them advantage, especially if they lose fewer of their warriors. They've just evened the odds with you when it comes to fighting. Plague gripped and weakened the hobbled empire. The signs had been obvious, and yet the Byzantines had done nothing. The Gothic leadership had even squabbled and fought, leaving them vulnerable and weak. And yet the Byzantines had done nothing. Why? because they had been even more divided. The attention of imperial court had been entirely on the east, first on the Persians and then on the plague, and so there'd been little direct oversight of Italy. Meanwhile, the question of overall command had never been settled, and so instead, dozens of Byzantine commanders operated quasi-independently across the Italian peninsula. This all meant that when the Goths had finally settled their differences and come together under a man named Totila, Italy was ripe for the conquest. As the Gothic forces swept south, the towns, which were under-garrisoned and frustrated by high Byzantine taxes, threw open their doors. Unity is key. I mean, look at what Robert the Bruce was able to do in Scotland in the Scottish Wars of Independence. There had been fractures all along in the Scottish clans, and that division kept them from being able to unite against England. Even united, it was a tough ask, taking on the might of England. But once he was able to unite the clans, it made a difference. But now you fast forward a couple hundred years to the time of the Jacobite rebellions and you have, you're never able to bring unity in that division among the clans. And so you've got clans loyal to the monarchy and other clans that are loyal to the Jacobite pretender king. Uh, and that division keeps them from being able to unite. And when the Romans tried to retaliate, it only ended in disaster. In one famous attempt, the Byzantine forces had actually got someone to betray one of the Ostrogothic strongholds at Verona. And while a force of a hundred men snuck inside and threw open the gates, the eleven commanders of the Byzantine army assembled outside bickered about how to split the loot from the town. And so caught up were they in this argument that no one ever actually ordered their army to go through the now open gates. Before the commanders were done infighting, the Ostrogoths had re-seized the gate, and the Roman force trapped inside had to leap over the city wall in an attempt to escape. Shortly after that, a Roman force of 12,000 was scattered by 5,000 men under Totila. And, and Justinian's got his hands full with this plague and with his eastern threat, so he's not even able to really focus on this. But they desperately need an overall commander to take charge of all this. Ugh. Italy became theirs for the taking. Save for a few major cities and a few well-fortified coastal towns, all of Italy, all of Belisarius' hard-won conquests, fell to the Gothic forces. Even Naples, with its strong walls, couldn't stand against the Ostrogothic king. 
Twice the Romans tried to resupply it from Sicily, but twice they failed. Once by having their fleet scattered by the fleet of Totila, and once by nature herself when the wind turned against them. And when Naples, isolated and starving, at last handed over the keys to the city, Justinian knew it was time. He needed to get Belisarius back in the fight. But the empire was already strained to its limits. Just and I want to point something out here that many of you have made reference to, is that while Extra History is doing a good job telling this story, there are some things that maybe are not coming through clearly on this. And one of those is that there's never really been a full amount of trust in Justinian when it comes to Belisarius, right? We've talked in several episodes about how in the past in Rome, the powers that be in the Roman Empire would look very kind of leering with their eyes toward generals who are successful because of the fear of that general using that power and turning it into something political. Well, that's the, been the case here too, even though it seems like for the most part, Justinian hasn't done that. Justinian and, and Theodora have always kind of mistrusted Belisarius to a degree and kind of kept him a little bit at arm's length. And we saw some of that in the last episode where he kind of stripped some of his power from him in order to keep him from getting too powerful. But he also recognizes that he's got quite a military mind that he's going to have to unleash on this problem in Italy. Justinian made Belisarius underwrite the cost of the war, sending him off essentially without an army to collect conscripts along the way. But through all of Thrace and Illyricum, Belisarius could only raise 4,000 men. And when he got to Italy, he found the situation to be even worse. There were very few Roman soldiers there, and they'd already gone for years without pay. Mm. Morale was at rock bottom, and every day more of them deserted to go join the Ostrogoths. Belisarius had to start all over again, from the very boot of Italy. He secured a few towns and established a presence in a few ports, but soon he found himself out of resources. Imagine how frustrating that is as a general. You have already fought this this war once. You've already conquered this land once. The minute you leave, it all falls apart, and now you got to come back and do it all again. He had neither the men, nor the arms, nor the supplies he needed. And at the same time, many of those that he'd recruited along the road to Italy got word of the fact that barbarian tribes had invaded their homeland and deserted to defend their own families and farms. And while Belisarius had a few successes, and would on occasion even best Totila in the field, he could never capitalize on those successes enough to move the war forward. Plagued by insubordination and low morale, he couldn't even defend Rome, the city he had spent so much of his life trying to bring back into the empire, the goal that had personally cost him so much. The Byzantine Empire just couldn't support the war in Italy any longer. The ravages of the barbarians, the assaults of Cosro, the utter devastation of the plague, all of these had sapped the empire of its vitality, of its strength. Its reserves had all been spent on monumental buildings and grand campaigns, and when these waves of tragedy had hit, there was simply nothing left to fall back on. And you can be the, the brightest military mind, you can have the best strategy, the best funded army, not that they have any, uh, not that they have some of those things. You can have all of that, but you can't account for the unaccountable. Things like the plague, the weather. These are things that the best laid plans can't account for. And so, though Belisarius was able to briefly reoccupy Rome, he was soon recalled to defend Constantinople, never to reunite Italy, and never to campaign again. And Rome, that city that was to be his and Justinian's legacy, fell again to the Ostrogoths not long after he departed. Meanwhile, rebellion had flared up in Africa, and the same old story of lack of pay, disunity of command, and plague spreading through the army kept the rebellion alive for years. Fortunately, this rebellion was eventually successfully quelled the same year Belisarius withdrew from Italy, a much-needed victory amidst so many losses. It had cost more time and money than it ever should have, but at least it would not go the way of Italy. Then, in 548, Theodora died of cancer. Mm. Justinian wept at her casket, the indomitable emperor in tears for all to see. He would not marry again, even though he lacked an heir. He chose... So I found myself curious when they talked about her coffin, about the state of their burial place, Justinian and Theodora. And it was actually in the Church of the Holy Apostles in what is now Istanbul, was then Constantinople. Uh, Constantine was buried there in um, the 4th century. Uh, but unfortunately, it was 
it was used for a burial place for the Byzantine emperors up until the year 1028. Uh, but unfortunately, after the Turkish conquest, it was destroyed and turned into a mosque. And for the most part, those graves have been lost. You can see some of the parts of the sarcophagi. I think, I think it's sarcophagi. The sarcophaguses, if you will, um, have been salvaged. One of them was turned into a fountain. Um, so unfortunately, and, and lest we get too hard on the Muslims for how they treated this incredibly historic site with these Byzantine emperors, Christians did no better, even to their own kind. Look at what Henry VIII did to the monasteries in England in the 16th century. Just horrible, horrible destruction of history. Chose to name his nephew-in-law as his successor, rather than betray her memory. But even as she had neared her death, the entire time he never forgot his empire. After so many failures and setbacks, many others would have just sunk into dejection and let the empire rot, but never Justinian. Say what you will about him, but Justinian never once abandoned what he thought to be his duty. He worked to slowly put the pieces back together with the same tireless spirit he had applied in the glorious days after the Nika revolt, but perhaps without the same joy. He continued the war in Lazica, but prevented the conflict from turning into an all-out war between the Byzantines and the Persians. He Not only without the same joy, but also let's recognize that Theodora was a pretty solid influence on the empire herself, so he's missing that now. Tried to reorganize the defenses to put up some resistance to the ever-mounting barbarian raids from the north. He began to get the Byzantine economy moving again, and though it was often complained about, he re-established a system of taxation to slowly fill the imperial treasury, and to pay for all the armies he needed to protect an empire assailed on all sides. And though the weight of the world could be seen on him after Theodora's death, though he had perhaps lost some of the fire he once possessed, and no longer found as much joy in his old passions, he did undertake one last great project. A project that had been most dear to Theodora. It would perhaps be the greatest he ever embarked on, and it would perhaps be his greatest failure. One last time, Justinian attempted to heal the split in the church that had plagued his empire. A split that would do more damage to the empire than barbarian raids or Persian kings, one which would last for centuries. If we talk more about Byzantium in future series, this split is going to keep coming up. Mm. Now, when most of us think about splits in Christianity, we usually think about the split between Protestant and Catholic. But this divide was just as bitter and ran just as deep. This was the divide between the Monophysites and the Orthodox. It was a problem that Justinian had studied for years. Theodora had been Monophysite. He himself was Orthodox. Their reign was supposed to be a symbol of unity, and yet the divide had persisted. He had many times tried to find solutions, but nothing had ever stuck. But he had one final grand idea. The church was split concerning a complex theological question over the singular or dual nature of Christ. But in practicality, it really came down to whether one accepted or refused the decisions of the Council of Chalcedon, where the... So when they're talking about the dual nature of Christ, it's the idea uh, in theology that Jesus was fully human, but also fully divine. Uh, which obviously sounds like kind of an oxymoron to say you're both human and a god. Um, but that's the idea. Is he just human? Is he just divine? Or is he both at the same time? And that was what they were debating over. The dual nature of Christ had become orthodoxy. Justinian thought that he'd found a clever solution in the fact that the three strongest voices supporting that dual nature view also came from the now considered heretical Nestorian branch of Christianity. So, if he could just get everybody to condemn those guys, they could serve as scapegoats for the problem. Monophysite- The enemy of my enemy is my friend. ...could accept Chalcedon and everybody could move on. He had made this proclamation in the year 543 while Theodora was still alive, but he would fight to get the leaders of the church to sign on for the rest of his life. He worked to see that the Pope, who was staying with him during a period where he was exiled from Rome, because it was in Ostrogothic hands, endorsed his view. The Pope eventually gave in and agreed, though with great reluctance because he knew exactly what it would mean to his followers in Italy. He knew what would eventually prove true. This would not heal the schism in the East. Rather, it would simply end up creating a schism in the West. And so Italy has fallen. Theodora is gone, and the great project that their union was supposed to symbolize, the healing of the faith of the Empire, lies in tatters. But slowly, Justinian is rebuilding. He's not done yet. So join us next time as we conclude the reign of Justinian. All right, let's dive right into part 12.
Our time with Justinian is nearly at an end. His conquest of Rome lost, his people decimated by plague. The last man to dream of a reunited Rome has seen that dream slip through his fingers. But Justinian was never idle, even as he crossed his 65th year, and he was never one to give up on that dream. And though it would never seem as natural or as inevitable as it must have in the 530s, to the mind of Justinian, the thing that had once seemed his glorious destiny was still in the 550s his responsibility. Mm. And so, where luck, brilliance, and splendor once served, labor, persistence, and time would now be his tools. And these are all, let's go back and look at that. Brilliance and splendor once served, labor, persistence, and time would now be his All of that stuff matters, right? In life in general. You can have all the hard work in the world, but you still need luck. You still need help from other people. You still need things to go your way occasionally. And there are other people who don't put in any of that stuff, and they still get lucky. You know, it just, you never really know for sure. His tools. With monumental effort, an empire near ruin was brought back to a functioning and even somewhat prosperous state. Impressive. With renewed national fortunes came that lifeblood of armies, money. With the cash in hand to once again pay soldiers and equip troops, Justinian prepared to deal with the threats that had assailed the empire from all sides. And so we come to one of the most inscrutable parts of the reign of Justinian, the Last Company the final group of men that he would choose to execute his will and restore the empire. For he chose a group of men who seemed like impossible candidates. They were ancient men, the last of a generation. He picked the Septarian Basis to retake Lazica, though he had largely been at fault for re-losing Rome. He chose Scholasticus, a court eunuch without any experience in the field, to command forays against the Slavs to the north and to retake Italy. But I think what we've seen so far, if there's anything that's true about Justinian, it's that he tends to have a pretty good eye for talent. Some of these people tend to be a little bit corrupt, too. But I think you generally, you know, if you're going to take somebody who's going to be corrupt either way in a powerful position, because most people, when they get into positions of power like that in this time, are going to be at least a little bit corrupt. I'm not justifying it, but that's just let's accept that's the reality. Uh, but they're also talented. And throughout history, there have been men who have one of their greatest gifts has been to be able to recognize talent in other people. Uh, in American history, for example, I think of uh, John J. Pershing, who was the commanding general of American forces during World War I. Great eye for talent. People like George Patton and George C. Marshall that he gives important roles in places where they're strong. George Washington was a fantastic eye for talent for people like uh, like General Nathaniel Green or someone like Marquis de Lafayette or Alexander Hamilton. He picked the aging eunuch Narses, the same Narses who had bribed the deems for Justinian during Nica, and yes, the very same guy who may have doomed the first Italian campaign by disputing Belisarius's commands. It was a strange bunch to put in charge of an army, and yet in Lazica they won. They took Petra and at last made a peace mm. with Persia that recognized Lazica as part of the Roman sphere. And in the Balkans they won. It may have taken some diplomatic wizardry from Justinian, but they won. And in Italy? In Italy, Narses did what Belisarius could never do. Mm. He finally kicked the Ostrogoths out of Italy entirely. That would have probably galled Belisarius to no end that Narses was able to go in and do that. Sure, he had 20,000 men at his disposal yeah, and helps. a full purse to work with, but with these resources, he was at last able to pin the Ostrogoths down in open battle and truly, conclusively beat them in the field. In Italy, they finally won. Heck, while Narses was out in Italy, Justinian even received a letter from Hispania requesting his help and sent 2,000 men under the command of the octogenarian bureaucrat Liberius, who promptly took 80s. over half the country and set up the province of Spania. If nothing else, Justinian's one great talent was somehow, even when all odds seemed against it, knowing exactly the right person to pick for a job. And that talent hadn't failed him, even when so much else had. But nothing is ever quite done. A wave of natural disasters hit the empire, and then the plague returned. Why Again, you can't account for this stuff, man. You can do everything right, and then natural disasters and plague come along, and you're like, come on, really? Ugh. But I tell you what, I will say this. Other times when the plague has hit, it has taken sometimes centuries for these nations to recover. And I also understand that when I use the word nation, it doesn't mean the same thing it does today. Uh, these empires. Uh, in this case, he gets them back on their feet pretty quickly. Well, it didn't quite bring the empire to its knees the way the first wave did. It did create an opening for the Bulgars to sweep out of the north and raid the empire again. 
A contingent of them even came within a hundred kilometers of Constantinople. With no other armies nearby, Justinian called on Belisarius one last time. The general, who had long since put down his arms, gathered together a force of retired soldiers, guardsmen, and volunteers from the Deems for one last service to the Empire. And here he did what Belisarius does. He set far more campfires than he had men, and as the battle began, he had his main force make as much noise as possible while he secreted away a part of his army for an ambush. And when the Bulgar forces attacked, they thought themselves outnumbered and surrounded as the ambush force poured fire from one side, and they heard the great din from the other. And so they fled. But that would be the last service for Belisarius. And one by one, the chapter closed on all of our players. Trebonian had died in 542, Theodora in 548, John the Cappadocian fades out of the historical records sometime in the 550s. In 554, mortality makes even our historian Procopius put down his mm. pen. And Belisarius? He himself passed in 565. Almost all of the minor players, those who have just had a bit part on Justinian's stage, they too are dead. Justinian is alone. The only one to outlive them all would be Narses, who would make it to the grand old age of 95. Of course he but did. But he was out there in Italy, reorganizing the province. A generation of greatness had passed. Justinian would spend his last years trying to consolidate what he'd achieved, and continuing his ill-fated attempts to reconcile the Christian church. But the days of glory and of boundless empire were at an end. In 565, after one of the longest reigns of any emperor in Roman history, and just a few months after Belisarius, he too mm. died. It's almost impossible not it's really to wonder- appropriate, it seems, that Justinian and Belisarius would die within a few months of each other. There's just, and there's, but that happens a lot in history, right? And it happens a lot in families too. Not that I'm saying these two were like spouses, but how often do we see spouses go just a couple of months apart? My own, the parents who raised me, uh, four months, five months apart from each other. And uh, sometimes it's even days. Under what his last thoughts were. Did he see the success of his conquests or their cost? Did he die a man disappointed at failure to achieve his dream, to see a reunited Rome and a reunited church? Or did he look out at the Hagia Sophia one last time and think about how much he'd grown the empire, how he'd rationalized the laws, brought Rome back into the fold, and seen the empire through the plague without being torn apart by civil war? We'll never know. To this day, Justinian remains one of the great what-ifs of history. What if the plague hadn't struck? Mm. What if the Ostrogoths had capitulated one of those dozen times they were just about to? What if the Persians had been led by somebody less competent, or just been a little slower to attack? What if Justinian's successors were as energetic and as capable as he had been? Yeah, it's it's very possible that if those what-ifs, if some of those what-ifs go a different way, we see a real rebirth of the Roman Empire, a uniting of it that maybe changes the direction of European history and therefore world history. Uh, instead, we're going to start to see uh, the Franks really kind of take center stage in Western Europe. If any one of those things had turned out differently, perhaps we would consider him the greatest Roman emperor of all time. Perhaps the West would speak Greek and Latin and still see Constantinople as its capital. But none of those what-ifs took place, and within a hundred years almost everything he had gained would be lost. Only the Hagia Sophia and his law code would truly endure. And for his conquests, for his vision of a Western Empire, what did he sacrifice? Perhaps everything. He emptied the Byzantine treasury, taxed heavily, created thousands of miles of new borders to guard for an empire reduced by plague and a soldiery reduced by his own wars. I can't help but wonder, and I know that it's just been human nature throughout history to do these conquests and to fight these wars. And there was really nothing that was going to change that. But how different, how far more advanced would be we be as civilization if all of this money that had been spent on wars throughout the centuries had been invested in people and in ideas and in technology and science instead? Never know. Italy would turn out to cost the empire more than it ever brought in, and North Africa would suffer a series of rebellions and convulsions due to his inability to pay the troops there. Would the Byzantines be so unprepared for the Muslim conquest 70 years later if Justinian hadn't squandered the empire's resources on the ephemeral west? Would the empire have been bled dry by continuous Persian wars and further conflict with barbarian tribes to the north if Justinian had just instead focused all that energy on settling these problems rather than his romantic dream of restoring Rome? 
But for all this, one can't help but respect the dream and the monumental efforts of the men of his age to make it come true. And in hearing about his work, one can't help but get a little lost in that dream, and imagine what the Empire would have been if he'd achieved the success he came so close to. And so we leave Justinian and all those who stood by his side as a question and a cautionary tale, an enigma and a promise, a parable to inspire us to dream, and a warning against being blinded by our own vision. Mm. And though the reign of Justinian is at an end, we continue to feel the echoes of these men and women centuries yeah. later, their triumphs and their failures. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. All right, that was fascinating. And there is a lot more. A lot of you have suggested uh, some other series that are really fantastic when it comes to following, for example, Belisarius and his conquest. We will definitely revisit this story some more down the road. So rest assured that's going to be happening. Big shout out to Andrew in Ceres, California. And Dane in Tacoma, Washington. Thank you guys so much for your continued support through Patreon. We'll see you again next time with something completely new. Thanks for watching.